Welcome. We're going to be talking about John 3.16 this session. And I guarantee you, I'm 99.99% sure that you have never heard of the stuff that we're going to talk about. We're going to be getting into things. We're going to be talking about this verse in ways that you've never heard before. I'm telling you, I'm going to, I'm going to get into things that your pastor, that your priest has never told you before. It's the top number one favorite Bible verse in the entire world, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is a cherry-picked verse. What I mean is a lot of people, I mean by far a lot of people, pick this verse out from the scriptures and leave a lot of other ver verses behind. They pick this out. They take this out of context to make it sound the way that they want it to sound, okay? Now, a lot of preachers and, and a lot of evangelists and perhaps even the your favorite evangelists and perhaps even the, the your most favorite pastors and teachers that you've heard all of your life have used this verse to make people feel comfortable feel good and quote unquote draw people to Jesus but the question is how much does God love the entire world, every single person that was ever born from Adam to today, okay? And I know some of you are probably going like, what do you mean how much? We know that God loves everybody like infinitely, in, in you know, immeasurably much. Now, I want to bring to your attention some factoids, some gold nuggets from the scripture. Jesus called many people a lot of names, and he wasn't nice to a lot of people. Consider the fact that he made people angry all the time, okay? Almost everywhere he went, he made people angry. He called people whitewashed tombs. You know, you look good on the outside, but inside you're stinking, rotten, filthy, and you are rotten. You, you, you are stench to God. You are a grave full of rotten flesh. You are a whitewashed tomb. He told, he called people sons of Satan. In John chapter eight, he said to a whole lot of people, you are sons of Satan. You are children of your father, the devil. Okay. He called people children of hell. He called people a brood of vipers. You're a family of snakes. He called people hypocrites. He used this word many, many, many times. Now, think about this. He even called a woman a dog and refused to heal her because of her nationality. Okay? This is the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? Now, can you imagine that woman after Jesus said, no, I'm not going to heal you. You are not a Jew. I'm here only for Jews. I'm not given the children's bread, the children of Israel, the bread from God, the, you know, the blessings of God to dogs. You know, can you just imagine her going away and going, Jesus loves me, this I know. How about the Pharisees that he called children of the devil? How about the Pharisees that he called hypocrites all the time? How about the people that he called sons of Satan, sons of hell? You know, you are full of darkness. You hate the light. He called Herod a fox. You know, all these people, he made them angry so much. I mean, time and time again, they tried to kill him. And ultimately, they did. Why is it that there were so many people, it seemed like almost everybody, come the time when he was arrested, was, was calling out for his crucifixion? Because he said in John chapter 7, the world hates me. Think about this. Is this the Jesus of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, loved everybody? He said, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. Now today, if you just call people a sinner, if you say, well, what you're doing, that's a sin. 
That's wrong. Well, some people might say that's hate speech. Well, how about being called children of the devil? How about being called a dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking corpse in a tomb that's whitewashed? You know, how about being called a dog and being refused service because of your nationality. Now, this is what Jesus did. Now, again, to, to bring it into full perspective, because the woman whom Jesus called a dog was very persistent and wouldn't take no for an answer. Finally, Jesus gave in to her and he did heal her. Okay. So my question is, how much did God love everybody? Did God love everybody? Okay, again, like I said, this verse is cherry picked. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it makes the, these, these pastors, and I'm sure a lot of you, you've been taught all of your life that it means that God loves every single person in the world. Now, I, one of the greatest problems of Christians today is that they are so full of arrogance, they are so full of pride, they get offended if you say anything against what they believe, okay? As if everything they believe is the truth, as if they're so good, these Christians are so good that they would never, ever believe something that is in error. They would never, ever believe a lie. They would never, ever believe a half-truth. I encourage all of you, every one of you, to be humble enough to say, you know what, you know what, Christopher, I could be wrong. Tell me more. Tell me more. I want to know more about God. I am hungry for the scriptures. People cherry pick this verse. Let's say, for example, you can d use the same kind of exegesis, the same kind of way of just picking a verse out and making it sound like the way you want it to sound. You can do the same thing with Amos 4, verse 4. God said, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin more. Oh, I mean, people can say, yeah, man, let's go to Bethel and sin. Let's go to Gilgal and sin some more. God said we're supposed to do it. Now, what you do, what you need to realize is, is that taking that one verse, Amos 4, 4, saying, you know, go to Bethel and sin without reading the entire context of the scripture. And I mean, not only just the, the surrounding verses and, and not only just the whole chapter, but all of scripture, you will see that God was basically, it was almost like a, it was almost sarcasm because he was, he goes on to say how he was, he's going to destroy them because of their sin. He said, go to Gilgal and sin or go to Bethel and sin, go to Gilgal, sin more. Well, he is going to it says later he's going to punish them greatly and, he, and even to the point of destroying them because of their sin. So in the same way, let's not take John 3.16 out of context. So does God so love the entire world, every single person that's ever lived? Many of you would say, absolutely, God is love. That means if God is love, that means, logically speaking, that God loves everything everybody, everybody that's ever lived from Adam until today, because God is love. It's because of that's who he is. Now, let's just put this, let's just put that aside for a second. I'm coming back to that in just a minute. Consider the story of Nadab and Abihu. These were uh, gentlemen who offered uh, strange fire before the, before the Lord. They did not perform the rituals properly and it said that god came as a consuming fire and basically cremated them right on right on the spot they just turned to ashes god consumed them as a consuming fire you see yes the bible does say god is love but does that mean really that god loves everybody that's ever lived and ever will live hmm Let's take that same way of interpretation. Let's take that same rule and apply it to this. It says that God is a consuming fire also. The scriptures also say that God is a consuming fire. Does that mean that God consumes everybody with fire right now? 
everybody that's ever lived, does that mean that God consumed them all with fire? As he did with Nadab and Abihu? Is that, is that what it means? Of course not. He consumed a few with fire. Yes, he did. But he didn't consume everybody with fire. Obviously not. In the same way, just because God is love, it doesn't mean that he loves everybody at all time. You know, everybody past, present, and future. Again, let me make this very clear. Because just because it says God is love doesn't mean he loves everybody because it also says God is a consuming fire. Doesn't mean that he consumes everybody with fire like he did Nadab and Abihu. No, of course not. So the argument that God is love and that means that God loves everybody just doesn't hold water because God is a consuming fire also and he's not consuming everybody with fire. He's not instantly cremating everybody, you know, at birth. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Uh, so that argument about God is love, it just doesn't hold water. Okay. Now you might say, well, yeah, but it says very clearly God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Okay. So then we got to say, well, what, is it, what does he mean by the world? Does he mean every single person? Let's go into other passages of Scripture in the New Testament that uses the same word in the original Greek manuscripts, cosmos. The word cosmos is used here. For God so loved the cosmos that he gave, that he gave his only begotten Son. Okay? So Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, and Luke chapter 4, verse 5 says that the devil, when, he, when, the, dev, when the devil was tempting Jesus, the devil took Jesus up in a very high mountain, and it says, showed him the whole world from the top of the mountain. Does that mean that the devil showed Jesus every single person from the mountain? No. It just means, it, generally speaking, he saw other lands other than just the land of Israel. Okay, He saw the surrounding areas. He saw the non, the Gentile lands. He, you know, he saw the Gentile lands. He saw, generally speaking, he saw the world. Okay? Let's look at another scripture. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus is talking to his disciples here, okay? There are only a few disciples he's talking to, relatively speaking. He said, go into all the world. Same word, cosmos. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Does that mean that Jesus commanded his disciples right there and then, those few disciples, that they're all supposed to go to every single person ever alive? all over the world, travel the entire globe and preach the gospel? Is that what it means? I would say not. There's no way the, the disciples, you know, 12 disciples could, you know, reach everybody, you know, in every remote village and every remote tribe and every remote forest that these people live in. Okay, every every remote cave that they live in. There's no way that his disciples would would reach every single living person alive. So the world, so the word world here doesn't mean every single person alive. It just means generally speaking, go out. You know, beyond our own nation. Okay, generally generally speaking. Once again, John chapter one verse twenty nine says. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Now, does that mean that the Lamb of God has taken away the sin of every living pe person alive? Does that mean that every living person that's ever lived and lives today and that will live don't have their sin no more? It's taken away? They don't sin anymore? They're perfect. They don't sin no more. Does that mean that the whole world means every person here? Obviously not. And again, John chapter 8, verse 26, and John chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus was saying to his disciples that he, is spe he speaks to the entire world. Does that mean that Jesus actually went personally and preached face to face with every single person living? You know, past, present, and future? No, we all know the answer is no. Again, the word world here doesn't mean every single person alive, okay? Now, here's a good one. John chapter 17, verse 9. Jesus 
while he's praying, he said to the Father, I am praying for those that you have given me. I, have, I am praying for my sheep. I do not pray for the world. John chapter 17, verse 9, Jesus said, I do not pray for the world. I'm not praying for the world. Now, if, if he loved the world, if he loved every single living person alive, in spite of the fact that he called them dogs and foxes and sinners and hypocrites and sons of Satan and, <laughs> and on and on and on it goes, in spite of the fact that he made them so angry they wanted to kill him and they finally did, uh, in spite of the fact that he did all that, shouldn't he be praying for the entire world because he loves the world? Because he loves everybody in the world? Don't you think he would pray for those whom he loves? Of course he would. He doesn't pray for those whom he doesn't love. We have the sheep, we have the goats. He saved the sheep, he cast the goats into hell. We have the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. He took the wise virgins and loved them, and the foolish virgins he rejected off into eternal damnation, it says. It says there are those who are the sons of God and those who are the slaves. Okay, He loved the sons. It doesn't say he loved the slaves as he loved the sons. So what you need to realize is this. Now, this is a, this talk about the world, this is a worldly principle. And anybody who's involved in marketing at all would know this principle. The principle is if you advertise to everybody, you advertise to nobody. You have to be specific. You have to be targeted, okay? If you love somebody, it means there are other people you do not love, okay? Because if you love everybody, you love nobody. Let me give you an example. Let's say there is a husband and a wife. The husband loves his wife. Now, if he loved his wife just as much as he loved every, any other woman, then that love would not be a real love. I mean, it wouldn't be a real, special, true, good love. It would be, it's not that he loves his wife. It's like he, at love, he doesn't love anybody. If he loves everybody, he doesn't love anybody because love has specificity in it. Love is distinguished love. True love is distinguished love. Years ago, I attended this World Food Festival, okay? And it was like, People, it was like an outdoor festival where, where people had like booths set up and people from all, like almost every major nation in the world, okay? There was like the Korean food over here. There was like the Chinese food over here. There was like the Indian food over here. There was like the, the Mexican food over here, okay? It was like from all over the world. Obviously, when you say this is the World Food Festival, you have the world is here. It doesn't mean that every single person in the world, every person that's ever lived and ever will live uh, is, is present there. It just means there are s s certain people from all over the world. In the same way, when John said, God so loved the world, he was talking about God loves certain people from all over the world, okay? From, from all over, from different nations. Generally speaking, God doesn't just love the Jews. He loves special people from nations that he chooses that he calls out from all over the world, okay? Doesn't mean he loves every single person that's ever lived. And I know a lot of people might say, well, still, you know what? That doesn't compute. I've been taught all my life. It's hard for me to accept that God doesn't love everybody. If you're trying to tell me that God loved everybody from Adam and Eve until today, then you're trying to tell me that God is a liar. Because you see in the scriptures, it says very, very specifically, very explicitly that Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Well, some people might say, well, no, no, God didn't hate Esau. He just didn't. He just didn't love him quite as much as Jacob. Well, I beg to differ with that because you look at the life of Jacob. He always got the breaks. He always got the blessings. Whereas Esau always got the shortest straw. He was always left with the curse. He was always left empty. If, if, if nothing else tells you that God hated Esau, it's the fact that he always got the shortest straw. He always was left with the worst 
end of the stick, so to speak, okay? But just in case you are a little bit unsettled about what the word world actually means, that it doesn't mean everybody, let's go on and, and read other passages of scripture with the same Greek word in it, cosmos. John chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus was talking about his disciples. He said, the world hates them. The world hates his disciples. Now think about it. Would the world, would world there mean every single person alive? How can it? I mean, everybody in the most remotest parts of the earth, you know, uh, the, the, the Han dynasty in, in, in China or the, the, um, the North American natives back in those days, you know, the, every single person that ever lived that time hated the disciples of Jesus. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to think that the word world here means every single person because it's impossible for every single person to hear about Jesus and his disciples, every single person in every single forest, in every single tribe, in every single cave, you know, of every single language, all of a sudden they all just know. And you know, no, it's impossible. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse 6. That's where it says that the apostles turned the world upside down. It's the same word, world, okay, cosmos. Now, does that mean that the apostles went and physically turned every single person that's alive, turned them upside down? Is that what that means? Of course not, okay? it's a, Again, it's a general figure of speech. In the same way, John 3.16 is a general figure of speech. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says that we did not receive the spirit of the world, but of, the, but of God, okay? So there's a contrast here. There is a there's opposition here. We don't have the spirit of the world, but we have the spirit of God. Like they fight against one another. How can God love the world, the spirit of everybody who has ever lived, if they fight against him and he's fighting against them? Doesn't make sense. So the word world here, again, doesn't mean every single person that's ever lived. Let's go on to another scripture. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. It says, when we're judged... We are chastened of the Lord. So when God judges you, you are chastened of the Lord. You are punished for your sin so that we're not condemned with the world. God is going to condemn the world. Oh, I love them. I condemn them. I love them. I can, No, I mean, get your facts straight here. There are people that God loves and there are people who God does not love. Okay. If you don't believe me, Check out John chapter 3, verse 36. I mean, everybody loves John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Same chapter, 20 verses later. John 3, verse 36 says that those who don't believe or those who don't obey God, the wrath of God abides on them. That's what John 3, 36 says. Same chapter from the same author, from the same hand that wrote the from from the same hand that wrote John 3:16, wrote John 3:36, saying that if you don't believe, if you don't obey, the word believe and obey means the same thing here, okay? You have the wrath of God abiding on you. Okay, not just God just doesn't punish you. It abiding means lives on you. The wrath of God lives on you. Try telling people. God so loved you that his wrath, that his anger lives on you. Okay? Let's go on to James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So it's very clear here that the world is an enemy of God. God is an enemy of the world, okay? And so they are fighting one another. You can't be a friend of the world and also be a friend of God, okay? You can't be a friend of God and be a friend of the world because they are opposite, okay? Opposite, okay? Why would God so love the world if, he, if, if he's fighting so hard against them and he tells you, no, you should not love the world? 
Let's go on to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Very clear, okay? Again, we have the world and God at opposite ends, okay? They are enemies of one another. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. You can't love you know, the uh, God and love the world at the same time, okay? And God, God's not going to say, oh, I love the world, but you don't love the world because if you love the world, my love is not in you. Doesn't make any sense, okay? Doesn't make any sense. Now, for those of you who are very, very staunch, the Bible is 66 books. I want to bring something to your attention at the end of your Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, we have Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. God said, I am the Lord, I change not. That's his promise to you at the end of the Old Testament. I'm not changing. I don't change. I don't change. I have no reason to change. I don't make mistakes. I have no reason to upgrade, to update. I am always up to date. I am. I know the end from the beginning. I don't need to improve. I am the Lord, I change not, okay? God doesn't change. Psalm chapter five, verse five says, God hates all the workers of iniquity. What does workers of iniquity mean? Those who sin, you do something against the law of God, you do something against the, the, the guidelines and the instructions and the commands that are given in the, in the scriptures. You do something against that, you're a worker of iniquity, you are a sinner, and according to the scriptures, Psalm 5, verse 5, God hates workers of iniquity. And again, Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, your 711 for today is, God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, don't forget also that Jesus himself, okay, I am the Lord that changed, I change not. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7, he said, many will come to me on the day of judgment. Many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, they'll prof- they'll, they're going to profess me as Lord. They're going to call me Lord. They're going to believe that I'm, I'm Lord. I'm, they're, gonna, they're the ones that made me Lord of their life. Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works in your name we've cast out demons we've we've uh, we've done miracles we've prophesied in your name we spoke your word and he says i'm going to turn to them and i'm going to say away from me depart from me you who work iniquity i never knew you out okay in context is away from me into the eternal fire into eternal torment again in matthew chapter 25 we have the sheep and the goats the goats were absolutely rejected by jesus into eternal fire into eternal condemnation okay for god so loved the world what does that mean it does not mean every single person that's ever lived it means that god picks out people from all over the world Okay, not a lot of people, but few, as Jesus said, many are on the on the road to destruction. Many are on the worldly path. Okay, of destruction, and and you know they're going to be basically falling into hellfire. But the way of God is straight, straight, and narrow. Okay, straight, shoot straight. Straight, strong, narrow. Straight and narrow. Jesus said, few there be that, that ever find it. Few there be that find it. That should cause you to shake in your boots. I mean, hey, we need to tremble at the word of God as it says in scriptures. God loves those who tremble at his word. Few there be that find the way of life. Few there be that find the way to heaven. I know in a lot of funerals, almost everybody, if not everybody, is thinking, oh, they're in a better place now. They're in heaven. It's not what Jesus said. No, seriously. (laughs) That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, "By by far, most people are going to hell. And very few will actually make it to heaven. 
God so loved the world. Just like in that f World Food Festival where there's just booths with just a few people from each nation in each booth. So there's going to be few people from different nations around the world that are going to make it to heaven. God so loved the world. Just like I attended that World Food Festival. The world was there in food. And so in heaven, the world would be there. Not every single person that's ever lived by far. That's against the words of God. That's against the words of Jesus. So there you have it. John 3.16, the top number one favorite Bible verse of all time. And may I add the most misunderstood and misinterpreted verse of all time. And the most taken out of context verse in all time. John 3.16. Don't forget to check out my other teachings. Don't forget to visit my blog. And don't forget to press into God with all your heart. Hey, do it with humility. You know, in Micah, it says that God loves those who come to him in humility. So be humble because there might be something that you believed all your life. It just wasn't exactly true. <laughs>